Real life St. Philip, the Metropolitan of Moscow and all Russia, Holy Master Bus. The great saint of Moscow, Philip, was descended from the famous and ancient boyar family of Kolishev, which came from Prussia in the 13th century. The father of St. Philip, the boyar Stephen Ivanovich, was an important official in the court of the great prince Vasily Ivanovich and enjoyed his favor and love. Not being blinded by this high dignity, however, he was marked by rare spiritual qualities, integrity, courage, and compassion. His spouse was Barbara, a pious and devout woman, who afterwards took monastic vows with the name of Bar Sanufi. In their life, the Kovachevi parents tried to fulfill the Lord's commandment about love for one's neighbor, and hence the doors of their home were always opened for the brethren and Christ, the poor, the orphan, and the animal. On the 11th of February in 1507, their first son was born, whom they named Theodore, the future Metropolitan Philip. Undoubtedly, they took pains to give their son the very best upbringing. His devout mother put into the pure soul of the child the seeds of piety. When Theodore grew up, they gave him over to learn reading and writing. Education in the schools of his time was primarily ecclesiastical. Consequently, it answers as well as possible the domestic upbringing of the boy and general tendency of his childhood. Theodore industriously undertook learning and soon began to love it. Noisy children's games no longer attracted Theodore, nor to the merrymaking of comrades. Indifference to worldly entertainments, the God-fearing boy had his own inclinations. From the first steps of his learning, he loved the reading of divine books, the sacred scriptures, the deeds of the Holy Fathers, and especially the lives of men worthy of wonder who lived in times of old, wherefrom he obtained lessons of a pious life. Theodore loved to attend the Temple of God with reverent attention. He listened to the inspired church chanting, and more and more became strengthened through this and his yearning for truth, for a life according to the commandments of God. Nevertheless, while living in the home of his parents, Theodore did not shun worldly occupations. He tried to understand everyday household affairs, and soon gained great experience in ordering a household. It is clear now that it is from this that after his aunt Solovsky, he showed himself as an exemplary administrator. High official duties, based the son of a well-known boy, state duties awaited him on the war fronts and in court posts, and for this naturally, book learning alone would not be sufficient. It was necessary to acquire, uh, to acquire practical knowledge of military arts, the parents of Theodore well knew this, and with this aim, they appointed to him special servants as teachers. They were obliged to train Theodore in horse riding to master the skill of arms and other military skills, without which it was impossible to get by from one assuming the duty of a boy or son. Such occupations, however, were not according to the soul of a quiet youth. Only out of obedience to the will of his parents did he perform everything which his tutors demanded of him. But his mind aspired towards divine contemplation, and all of his striving was directed not at excelling his comrades in dexterity and courage, but that he might fulfill the commandments of the Lord. Chaste, modest, and affable with all, Theodore therefore was not able to meet with those of his own age. He ran as from fire from the frivolous upper class youths with their boldness and ribald conduct preferring to meet people who spent their life in conversation in a manner such as he might be, such as might benefit him. Such sobriety in advance of his age, extraordinary wisdom and deeds, and other good qualities aroused general wonder was a cause of joy to his parents. When Theodore was twenty six years old, news concerning this well mannered young man belonging to a noble family reached the palace of the Tsar. The name of Theodore Kuldashev became known to the great prince Basil himself. Well, after the death of Basil Ivanovich soon followed, and it was only after the accession of his youthful son, John IV, under the guardianship of his mother, that the boy Theodore was summoned to serve in the palace of his own, together with other boy children. Because of his excellent qualities, he was quickly brought near to the sovereign who loved him, it was even possible to see that the paternal affection of the sovereign for him continuously increased. What a brilliant future awaited this young member of the court, and who would have been able even at a more mature age to resist the temptations of ambition. 
But his successes in court life were unable to tempt Theodore. On the contrary, precisely here, in the palace of the great prince, he saw all the vanity of the world and the instability of earthly blessings. He saw how difficult it was to preserve himself from the intrigues of the boys and the levity which reigned in the palace. Amidst the noise and pomp of the court, Theodore lived a lonely life and his thoughts on eternal salvation. And not at all that he changed in the manner of his life, he did not cease to be meek, and with man and as he repelled all the temptations which met him along the way. From early childhood he was devoutly disposed, having learned humility, obedience, and chastity, the main vows of monasticism. Theodore was already nigh to the decision to leave the world and consecrate himself to the service of God. Doubtless for this reason he did not enter into married life at that age, when according to the general custom, others entered into it, and now soon approached the hour when God himself called into a better life, it came to pass thus. The government of Helen Glinsky was replete with seditions and discords amidst the boys. During the absolute reign of her favorite, Prince Telephone of Obolensk, an insurrection was raised against him by the uncle of the sovereign, the Prince Andrew Ivanovich Storitsky. Some of the boys of the Kolichevi, together with others, joined in support of him. However, the plan of Prince Andrew was not crowned with success. He was constrained to surrender, but notwithstanding a sworn promise of Obolensk for the preservation of his life and freedom, Andrew was locked in a dungeon where he died. His followers were subjected to cruel tortures. Theodore's uncle, the boy John Ivanovich Umnikolichev, was subjected to torture and locked in a dungeon. Three other Kolachevs were beaten with whips and hanged. This unfortunate event could not but have an effect on the impressionable soul of Theodore. It became unbearable for him to remain in the palace. And at this time, perhaps, he began to be sorry that he, that beforehand he had not eluded all the troubles of the world for the solitary monastic life. He sought consolation and prayer in church. Once on the Lord's Day, soon after the events described above, in June of 1537, Theodore was in church in the liturgy. In the reading of the Holy Gospel, he heard the words, No man can serve two masses. Either he will love one and hate the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. It is not possible to serve God and man. The holy words of the Gospel, which Theodore had heard before, this time struck him, to such a degree they answered his inner feelings and his outer situation. Theodore took them for an inspiration from on high, as a call of Christ the Savior directed him personally, and his heart flared up the fire of the vine up. Then and there he decided without hesitation to depart from the vain world and were to consecrate his full life to serving God, but where was there to go? Even in his early youth, he had heard from the many pious wandering pilgrims that from the remote cold north on the edge of the universe in the oceanic abyss was the island of Solovki. It was a natural wilderness with mosses and weakly conifer trees growing on. But there was the dwelling of the writers Zosimus and Sabatius, famous for the severity of the life of its moss. And the death of loving Theodore decided to depart thence, at this time, he was already 30 years old. Hence, revealing his intention to no one, Theodore visited for the last time the Kremlin Cathedral and bowed his knees before the relics of the great wonder workers and kissed them, begging their help and spiritual guidance. Thus, he made provision for his journey with prayer. O Lord, my God, my enlightener and Savior, the defender of my life, establish me in thy way, and I shall go in thy truth. Having changed the splendid raiment of a courtier with the coarse garments of a commoner, Theodore secretly left Moscow. Wherefore, having broken every bond with the world, he departed without even bidding farewell to his kindred, which was painful for his tender, loving soul. And when he left, he took nothing with him except clothing and a small quantity of bread. The difficulty of the way for the wilderness and marshlands covered with dense forests and the remoteness of the entire journey would not even frighten Theodore and make him change his purpose. Insufficient knowledge of the way seemed uh, served to be for him a much greater obstacle. Most likely because of this, he deviated from the direct route and came out on the plain of Lake Onega. 
Here in one of the numerous villages on the shore named Shiza, he stopped to rest, was cheerfully received by a peasant named Sobota. Tales of the distance of the monastery of Soloki, and perhaps the impossibility of continuing his way because of the insufficiency of his means, induced Theodore to remain with Sobota. But in order that he would not be a burden to him, he paid for his living by the labor of his own hands, diligently fulfilling all the work entrusted to him. Seeing the love of labor and meekness of this unknown wanderer, Sobota seemed charged with the pasturing of his sheep, and he had destined from above to be a shepherd of a rational flock. According to the will of God, he began to shepherd an irrational one. Thus, some time passed, having been exhausted by his long journey, the strength of Theodore began to increase. He was so changed, thanks to this new manner of life. It was not easy to recognize in him a former member of the court. There was nothing to detain Theodore any longer at Sobotus. Moreover, stormy autumn was setting in, and the ice was able to cut off communication with Slovakia for the whole winter. Hastening to this quiet haven, Theodore bade farewell to his hospitable host and again set out on his journey. Meanwhile, Theodore's parents, not knowing where their beloved son had hidden himself, sought him all of Moscow and the neighboring towns and villages. And after a futile search, they gave themselves up to inconsolable grief, considering him to be dead. But Theodore was then already far away. He sailed across the sea towards the holy monasteries of Solovki. Finally, a monastery came into sight. Theodore came on to the island, and his heart was filled with unutterable joy. And with awe, he entered into the abode of the great men of prayer and wonder workers, the righteous Zolsimus, Sinatras, and Hermes. Having prayed before the shrine of the saints, Theodore went to the abbot to ask his blessing to go in the monastery. Alexis, as the abbot was named, was a good and simple heart at starts, but he regarded strictly the responsibility of a monk. He readily accepted the newcomer, but he laid on him a rigorous obedience as a preparation for the monastic life. Having received the blessing from the superior, Theodore accepted the obedience as charged to him with submissiveness, and not weakening in his zeal, he performed for more than a year and a half. It was wondrous to see, writes his biographer, uh, the son of known and famous parents, brought up in comfort and peace, gave himself up to such rigorous labors. He shot firewood, he dug and manured the earth in the garden, carried stones, transferred great catches of fish, he worked in the mill, and did all with diligence. With these ceaseless labors, he did not weaken his spirit from bodily illness. Was he grieved by that which he received from the unreasoning people for his labors, derision, cursing, and even beating? No one in the monastery knew who he was, but rather he received it with gratitude. The heavy physical labor did not have the Theodore from laying on himself together with it a spiritual wheel. He tried to understand thoroughly the manner of life of Solovetsky monks, and imitating his spiritual life of this brethren, to the astonishment of all, he put into practice everything with such resolution that he cut off from himself every worldly attachment. Thus the young struggler passed the first period of his monastic life. Finally besought the abbot and the brethren for the tonsure. Seeing the constant labors and obedience of the newcomer, the abbot and brethren the joy to fulfill his request, Theodore was tonsured and named the monasticism of Philip. According to monastic rules, the newly tonsured monk was given over in obedience to his sponsor experienced spiritual life, the elder Jonas Shamanoff, who was in his youth, the friend and fellow ascetic of the righteous Alexander of Sphere, and now occupied the post of father, confessor, and administrator in the monastery. Philip launched himself in the cell of the devout elder, and under his guidance began to struggle. Soon after his sancher, the newly beginning monk was sent to serve in the monastery's kitchen. With diligence and in silence, he labored here for the benefit of the bread. After a little time, Philip was transferred to the bakery. There he did not remain idle, he chopped wood, carried water, and all that was necessary. Part of the heavy labor in the bakery and kitchen, but have never abandoned the service of God. With the first striking of the bell, he appeared in the monastery church, and was the last to leave. But over returning after his daily labors to the cell of his superior, and after pious conversation with him, but up again stood in prayer. Who knows how many sleepless nights were passed by him in uninterrupted standing? When his body, exhausted from labors and vigil, demanded repose, 
The young struggler laid himself down on the bare earth, placing a stone for a pillow, and the Lord helped the humble laborer, encouraging him in struggles beyond the strength by heavenly protection. In the Transfiguration Cathedral, we now display an icon of the Theotokos Klebina or Zapechna, which, according to tradition, appeared to Philip when he was carrying out his obedience as baker. The severe ascetical life of St. Philip was unable to escape general attention, and all began to speak him as about an exemplary monk. Very soon he gained the love and esteem of everyone because of his humility and piety. And his elder father Jonas, rejoicing in his disciple, prophetically foretold about him, This shall be the superior of our monastery. But universal praise did not tempt Philip. He avoided even the very shadow of earthly glory in which he had withdrawn to the monastery, fearing that because of it he might lose the heavenly kingdom. His soul sought after seclusion and desert signs. With the blessing of the abbot, Philip departed from the monastery to the interior of the island, into the wild and impenetrable forest, and began to live there unseen by anyone. And St. Philip passed not a few years there in the wilderness. Having practiced silence and divine vision in the quiet solitude, he finally returned to the monastery he had abandoned and was to labor patiently together with the brethren as before. The abbot Alexis had already for a long time turned his attention to the struggles and the mindness and sobriety of the young struggler. Finding himself now in his old age, he made Philip his assistant in the affairs of directing the monastery, having charged him with the supervision of the beginning novices. And Philip strove with all his strength to justify the confidence of his superior in him. Through his diligent fulfillment of his orders, he became his right hand in support of his old age. With the tenderness of his son, he comforted the elder in sickness and consoled him in grief. Nine years of the monastic life of St. Philip passed. Aggravated by his ailments, the aging Christus began to wish to give up his position as abbot, having beheld in mind the worthiness of Philip and the common love of the brethren for him, he revealed his desire to surrender the direction of the monastery to him. Thereupon he summoned all together and announced the desire to have Philip as his successor. But Philip did not wish to hear about this, the power should be offered him, considering according to his humility, it more fitting for himself that he should obey rather than admonish others. And the abbot gathered together all the brethren in council and said, Now I am old and my feeble strength needs rest. Whom do you choose for yourselves, your superior, in my place? At the question of the abbot, all answered with one voice, There is not one better than Philip for our direction. For no one is able to eat equal to his godly life, his intelligence, and his experience. After that, Philip did not dare contradict the common choice and agreed to assume the dignity of superior. The abbot Alexis immediately sent a letter of recommendation to the Archbishop of Novgorod, Theodosius, which he answered on behalf of all the brethren, that Philip be raised the dignity of abbot of Solovetsk. Several elders were sent from the monastery and delivered the letter to Novgorod. Having received the blessing of the Archbishop, they said to him, Holy Vladika, the council of the Solovetsky Monastery entreats you to install him on the abbots the monk Philip, who was sent with us. The elders favorably received the request of the Solovetsky elders, as he had heard before of Philip. However, he asked him about the one chosen, concerning his fleeing the intention of his elder. Why do I not see him among you, in order that they bring him before him? Philip came in before the hierarch and received his blessing. From his conversation with him, the archbishop was convinced of his experience and gifts. Therefore, he soon ordained Philip to the priesthood and entrusted him with the abbot's staff. Turning to the brethren who were accompanying him, he said, Behold your father, having have him as an image of Christ, and submit to him with all obedience. Having received church utensils for the monastery from the archbishop and precious gifts from many citizens, the Sobeski monks set out on their return journey. A festive welcome was arranged to the monastery for the new abbot. The old abbot Alexis, having summoned his remaining strength, came out with all the brethren for the meeting. They solemnly led St. Philip into the church, and then went on the intoning of the litany for the sovereign. The letter from the archbishop was proclaimed publicly. They raised him to the abbot's place. Then the new abbot preached the breath in his first sermon, and all the priests and deacons prepared themselves for divine service on the 17th of August in 1548, 
he served his first liturgy in the Catholicon. On that day, all the brothers were communicated from his hand, and everyone saw his face in glory as if it had been the face of an angel. Having assumed his post as habit because of the illness of his predecessor Alexis, in spite of his own desire, St. Philip, when he saw the strength of his predecessor Alexis was returning, again departed into the wilderness. Father Alexis, for a second time, took upon himself the direction of the monastery. St. Philip struggled even more severely in silence, coming to the monastery only on feast days to receive the holy mysteries of Christ. Thus a year and a half went by, and the abbot Alexis was completely exhausted. Sensing his coming in, coming in he summoned the anchorite from the desert, and having gathered the breath and said, Already I am departing in the way of my fathers, therefore choose for yourselves a father and abbot. He bade farewell to all, quietly surrendered his soul unto God. When they had buried the abbot, the brethren of the monastery, according to the common council, as before, began to entreat Philip to take upon himself the abbacy, and he, acknowledging himself as the already elected lawful superior of the monastery, with the blessing of the archbishop, again accepted the abbacy from which he had fled into the desert. St. Philip used all of his strength in the adornment of St. Levesque Monastery. At that time, monastic affairs were in disorder. A fire, which had been taking place in 1515, had destroyed the monastery to the foundation. Notwithstanding the care of Abbot Alexis, who was almost completely unrebuilt, his building materials and money were insufficient to restore the monastery to its former state. Meanwhile, the number of the brethren increased. It was necessary to take care of them, and at the same time to take care for the expansion of the monastery. Many other labors and cares faced a new habit, but they did not frighten him. Thanks to his extraordinary economic abilities and his personal means, St. Philip quickly led the monastery to a blossoming condition. He can be called the new founder of Solovetsky Monastery, very much in it until this time is reminiscent of his work. Before everything, he turned his attentions to the monastery's economy, seeing that the monastery was in need even of necessities. At that time, Solovets was as sufficient vast lands on the islands of the White Sea, but the main source of her income was on its own properties or on the monastery estates situated on the banks of the sea. The severe climate and poor soil rendered these possessions completely unsuitable for agriculture. However, the natural resources of water and forest afforded abundant material for the establishment of various trades, of uh, which salt works were particularly widespread. The wise abbot began organizations from these. He increased and improved the salt works and again opened the iron trade. And Tsar Ivan Vasilovich, upon his request, gave the, gave the monastery duty-free privileges to sell 180 tons of salt and for the net sum to lay in supplies for monastery use, also duty-free. Together with the productivity of the estate, St. Philip at that time took care for the organization of the inner order of their management and for the improvement of the lives of the peasants which inhabited them. With his aim, he appointed honest men as stewards with strict responsibility and fixed salaries. He introduced into the government the principle of electoral voting, and for the apportionment of taxes, he ordered them to keep to the strictest justice. To all the offended, the abbot granted the right to personally appeal to him with complaints, and in the case of the justice of these complaints, he promised the fullest satisfaction. St. Philip took many measures, especially for the maintenance of good morals among the peasants. He entered into all the details of peasant life, strictly censuring drinking and gambling among them. He tried to discipline the peasants in labor, living in and warm the manner. Organizing the coastal properties in this manner, the untiring abbot devoted himself even more to the adornment and welfare of Solovsky. Here, from the time that St. Philip became abbot, extraordinary work began. He drained swamps by canals, he cleaned forests of brushwood, he fertilized the land, he formed excellent pastures, and bought horned cattle. He built for himself a skeet on Nikomsky Island, ten verse from the monastery, near which, according to the testament of St. Zosimus, cultivation was forbidden to the inhabitants. In the dense forests of Slovovki, 
He introduced the reindeer of the Laplanders, from the hides of which were made boots and clothing in the monastery workshops. Finally, having decided to commence the construction of stone buildings instead of wooden ones which burned down, St. Philip formed the brickworks and established the correct cutting down of the forest in such a way as not to destroy it without need, but rather to promote its reproduction. This necessitated the building of roads to pass through the forests and mountains and draining swamps in various directions from the monastery. As an indication of the entrance into the bay in the hollow of which stood Soloki Monastery, the Holy Abbot made great mounds, and on them, instead of white houses, he placed tall crosses. Then he built with his own means in the harbor of Zaritsky Island a dock for the guest house and kitchen, and on the same island two monastic habitations and a three-story building for cells and monastery works. The vast and almost unbroken labors required many working hands, which the monastery did not always have at its disposal. And so, in order to relieve the monks, St. Philip invented heretofore unheard of machines, especially agricultural ones, the various monastery jobs which had formerly been performed by men, such as a wagon which would fill itself and move itself and empty rye onto the drying apparatus, a kind of mechanism with the aid of which one old man would be able to sew with ten sieves, and also a special sieve which by itself sews and fills and separates both bran and meal, and itself sews and pours and separates groats and bran. But the most remarkable agricultural machine of St. Philip was called Philip's Mill. As formerly, when he supervised the building of Solovetsky Mills, so also now having become habit, he decided to rebuild the old mills again, conformable to the widening needs of the monastery. He chose for this 52 of the most convenient lakes of the numerous lakes which dot the island of Solovki. He united them by canals, opened a bank in the largest of these, widened this lake, and led a canal out to the sea itself. On this canal, within the monastery, were built the mills. Following all the extraordinary labors of St. Philip, that wild and inaccessible island in the wide sea became well organized and even comparatively productive, and the air was healthier and fresh. The monastery itself was beautified by the new stone buildings and splendid churches. On the building of churches, St. Philip placed especially great labor and care. Thus, while yet in the beginning of his abbacy, he planned to build a warm stone church in honor of the remission of the Mother of God. But not having sufficient means for such an extensive, expensive building, St. Philip turned with his petitions to Tsar Ivan the Terrible. And the sovereign, who was well disposed towards the abbot, granted the monastery an estate of Kolejemsk with forests and salt works, and a little later the seaside village of Sorotska, where besides the Trinity Church was originally buried St. Sabatius, so the means were found. But before setting about the building of this great church, St. Philip consulted the brethren, who humbly answered the words of their abbot, Father, the Lord God who inspired you with this is able to help you in this, and neither shall we object. Then St. Philip, seeing the agreement of the brethren, sent to Novgorod to master craftsmen. Upon their arrival, having called upon the help of the Lord and his all pure mother and the wonder workers of Solovetsk, he zealously set about the work. The construction lasted five years, and in 1557, on the 15th of August, St. Philip consecrated the new church in honor of the remission of the Mother of God with a chapel dedicated to the beheading of St. John the Forerunner, the patron saint of the Tsar. Near the church, he built a vast trapeze, twelve sages long, and around it several monastery workshops. The heavy domes of the trapeze are resting on one inner pillar, which, while holding them together with that, served as the foundation of a bell tower which rose above the trapeze. On this bell tower, St. Philip arranged the present ringing of bells cast in sloth with money donated by the Tsar instead of the ancient talentons and mallets. Having completed the building of the Dormition Church, the untiring abbot even then did not rest. In the following year, he announced to the brethren his intention to undertake the building of the yet larger and more splendid church in honor of the transfiguration of the Lord instead of the wooden church of the transfiguration built by St. Zosimus on that spot where the righteous one had seen the wondrous light and church in the air. 
The brethren were astonished at the intention of their abbot, knowing the insufficient means of the monastery. And this time they meekly expressed their misgivings. Remembering the words of the gospel, for which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, they said to him, Father, you behold the need and great poverty of the monastery, for there are no neighboring towns. Whence shall you acquire gold for the building of such a great church? St. Philip answered fervently, Brethren, hope in God is not deceived. If this thing is pleased to him, he shall grant us his inexhaustible treasures what is needed for the raising of a house to his holy name. Early St. Philip's hope in the help of God was not deceived. The Tsar became the benefactor of this church. He donated a thousand rubles for its construction, rented the monastery various privileges and favors. Encouraged by the gifts of the Tsar, St. Philip, after calling the best builders and artists, in 1558 commenced the building of a great new church, exceedingly remarkable for its time. Its foundation of 170 square sagens lay on store rooms and sepulchres, and the domes were propped up on immense columns. To the main altar, they joined two side chapels, one on the right to the wonder workers of Slovovsky, and one on the left of the Holy Archangel Michael. Four other chapels were built in the cathedral cupolas. St. Philip, however, did not have enough time to finish the building of the Transfiguration Church in his lifetime. But he did prepare beforehand the church utensils for it, multicolored glass and figured frames for the windows, precious fabrics, silver candlesticks, censers, books, and icons, the greater part of which was supplied through his personal means. On the north side of the church, under the porch, he himself dug his own grave, side by side with another one, in which he buried his spiritual father, a higher among Jonas. While he was diligently occupied with the renewal of the monastery, the building of the churches and buildings, St. Philip nonetheless took care for the preservation of everything which pertained to the memory of the builders of the monastery and the wonder workers of Sobolski. He found the wonder working icon of the Mother of God, the Rectress, which was brought to the wilderness island by the right of Sabatius and placed it over his grave. At a stone cross, he erected in the chapel where reposed St. Herman, his fellow ascetic. With his own hand, he repaired the extremely warm private psalter of the righteous Zosimus and embroidered his tattered garments, which he loved to vest himself for divine service. Finally, under the direction of St. Philip, the life of the righteous wonder worker of the Solovetsky was augmented by the writing of the miracles accomplished by all those pleasing to God in the time of his arrival on Solovetsky. A capable guide on equal and monastic life, St. Philip was at the same time a wise director and an experienced superior in spiritual activity. He entered into all the details of spiritual life, so well known to him, and tried to anticipate all the needs of the monks. Being conscious of the necessity for healthy food because of the severity of the northern climate, St. Philip improved the trapeze of the brethren, acquired plain and modest cloth for warm clothes, and ascertained as to who of the brethren needed more clothes and boots in his cell. For those who desired solitude, he set up hermitages in the depths of the forest, and on Zayatsi Island, he established an entire skeet with his own means, with wooden cells and workshops. Finally, in order to provide some rest and care for the aged and sickly monks, and workers of the monastery, and likewise probably for pilgrims who fell sick, he established a hospital in the monastery. But with all his care for the comfort and needs of the brethren, the holy abbot by no means permitted in the monastery idleness, laziness, worldly habits, and dissension from the monastic spirit. With great care, he accepted into the number of the brethren only such as, together with monasticism, love the labor which is inseparable from it. The abbot himself, guided all by his example, and amidst every burden and labor of various activity, he did not weaken a monastic struggle or an asceticism. As formerly, he did not cease his prayerful vigils and wore down his body with fasting, looking for the final victory over sensible thoughts and desires. From time to time, having become free from his affairs for a little, St. Philip loved to withdraw into silence, to a hermitage not far from Holy Lake, which even now bears the name Philipoff. 
Thus passing from struggle to struggle, from virtue to virtue, he ascended to the height of virtue. Rumors of the wisdom and virtue of the uh, Solabes abbot quickly spread far beyond the borders of the northern lands. With great attention did they regard him even in Moscow. In 1550 and 1551, St. Philip was summoned to Moscow by the Tsar, and he was found worthy of his favor. As acclamation of the holiness of the life of the abbot, they sent for him for the admonition and correction of those who were deceived in the faith, and even for those who had fallen into disgrace, having drawn upon themselves the wrath of the Tsar. In 1554, by a synodical decree, the former abbot of the Trinity Lavra, Artemius, was sent to Solovesk. Since he had been charged with complicity with the heretic Maxim, St. Philip was ordered by a synodical letter not only to hold Artemius in confinement in the monastery, but also to meet with him to convince him from Holy Scripture. A little later, in 1560, the celebrated father confessor and advisor of Tsar Ivan the Terrible, the priest Sylvester, was exiled to Solovsky. Here he took monastic vows with the name Spiridon and finished his life being loved and respected by the holy abbot in spite of the disfavor of the Tsar. The exile of Sylvester and the simultaneous departure from the court of the Tsar of Adeshef, another favorite and advisor of the Tsar, were only the beginning of some calamitous events breaking out in Moscow. And in them, by the predetermination of God, St. Philip would then take a personal part, no longer in the modest rank of abbot, but on the throne of the first hierarch of the Russian church. At that time, many changes took place with the Tsar Ivan the Terrible. Zealous for his own power, and incited by the whisperings of flatterers who were persuading him that his advisers were taking from him all his power and were themselves seeking to rule, he became suspicious and cruel, removed from him his former favorites, and fell under the influence of worthless people. Moreover, he soon declared all of the boys that were hateful to him as traitors, and he considered the clergy as spies in order to separate himself from them as much as possible. In 1565, the Tsar divided the entire government into the Oprichni and the Zemeshivi, having a pri- uh, organized for himself a special group of bodyguards, which called the Prichniki. The Tsar placed complete confidence in them. Using this, the Oprichniki did whatever they wished in Moscow. Their insolence reached even this, they robbed and murdered the innocent peasants for no reason and took for their own gain their properties and estates. No one dares complain about them to the Tsar. During these events, Metropolitan Athanasius, the sick and weakened old man, seeing the grief of the people, but not having in himself sufficient strength to oppose the Tsar, on May 16, 1566, resigned his post as Metropolitan, and retired to the Chudov Monastery, where he had been tortured years before. In his place was chosen the Holy Archbishop of Kazan, Herman. And as the future Metropolitan, he was already living in the First Hierarch's Palace. But a few days passed, and by the instigation of the Oprichniki, Herman was driven from the sea, because he had dared to address the Tsar with admonitions and reminders about his responsibility before the judgment seat of God. A new Metropolitan had to be chosen. Then the Tsar recalled Philip, about whom he held the best remembrances from his youth. According to the advice of the Holy Council and his attending boyars, he decided to raise him to the Metropolitan's throne. A letter was sent to Solovsky. The Tsar very graciously wrote to the abbot and summoned him immediately to Moscow for the purpose of spiritual counsel. Upon receiving the letter in a meeting, St. Philip announced the bread and the wood of the Tsar and his immediate departure. This news struck the brethren with deep grief. Perhaps they had a foreboding that they would see their beloved abbot no more. With sorrow, St. Philip left this monastery, but he consoled the spiritual children and admonished them to place all their hope in the Lord and his all pure mother, calling upon the aid of the righteous Zosimus and Sabatius to care for their salvation and to guard their monastic tradition. For the last time, St. Philip served the divine liturgy in his own monastery, partook of the holy mysteries with all the brethren, and after a farewell trapeze, he set out for the capital, parting with the blessed Solovets monks.
The road by which he traveled towards Moscow went to Novgorod, and there, at the two births, there came out to meet him some Novgorodians, men, women, and children. Drawing near to him, they bowed before him with tears and treated him, Father, be an intercessor for us and for our city before the Tsar. Plead for your fatherland. We have heard the Tsar is filled with wrath against us. Having favorably heard their request, he entered into their city, where he was joyfully received as its advocate and defender. The saint did not remain long in Opera. According to the summons of the Tsar, he hastened to the reigning city, where a warm reception awaited him. The Tsar himself showed much attention upon the arriving abbot. He showered him with generous gifts, spoke with him affectionately, and summoned him to his table. Finally, he decided to reveal to him the real reason for his summons to Moscow. But knowing the humility of the saint, the Tsar began to speak of other things working up to this. He described to him the serious condition of the church without a shepherd. He amiably revealed to him its difficulty in choosing a new first hierarch. In a conclusion, he announced to Philip, by his sovereign will and the election of the entire Holy Council, he had to become metropolitan. This conversation took place in the presence of the highest clergy and noblemen. And after the Tsar, the whole assembly unanimously acknowledged that St. Philip was worthy of the metropolitan's throne. The humble abbot was thunderstruck with such a high honor it fall to his law, and shedding tears from emotion, humbly answered, No merciful sovereign, do not separate me from the wilderness, do not charge me with a work beyond my strength, free me for the Lord's sake, free me, for it is unsafe to entrust a great burden to a small boat. But the Tsar insisted, and the bishops and boys tried to convince St. Philip with words of scripture not to contradict the divine calling and the will of the Tsar, and not to bury in the earth the talent given him by God. Then St. Philip, having been compelled by the Tsar and the entire assembly, announced in the church that he was ready to fulfill the will of the Tsar, only if he would abolish the Oprichniki, otherwise it was impossible for him to become metropolitan, and if they would try to force him, he would be compelled to leave the city. St. Philip demanded that the Tsar join again the kingdom which had become divided, that is, that he do away with the Oprichnik. This bold the man greatly annoyed the Tsar. It seemed that Philip it seemed that he would cast Philip out with dishonor, just as he had Herman. But the Tsar so greatly revered the Solovsky Abbot too much to decide upon his removal, and hence, according to the request of the archbishops and bishops, he mollified his anger against Philip and ordered them to convince Philip to become metropolitan, but not to enter into the affairs of the court and the Aprichnin but to consult with the Tsar in the same manner as former metropolitans had with his father and his grandfather. The clergy and noblemen entreated St. Philip with tears in their eyes to accept the post of metropolitan. Convinced of his virtues, they hoped that by the steadfastness of his soul and his wisdom, he would restore the Tsar and the kingdom to its former peace. After these things, Philip was convinced that he was not able to refuse, and he gave his consent to the archbishops and bishops, as it is written in the expressly compiled document that, according to the word of the Tsar and their blessing, he agrees that he will stay in the city and not meddle in the affairs of the Aprichniki or the domestic life of the Tsar. And furthermore, the metropolitan would not obstruct the Aprichniki and imperial court, as was decreed. As that the lengthy persuasion, St. Philip expressed his obedience to the word of the Tsar. But having declined from involvement in the political and personal affairs of the Tsar, he remained truly grieved for those who were innocently persecuted and spoke to the Tsar about evangelical truth and about the laws of the church on every occasion that they were trampled upon. On the 20th of July, the Sabor's decree was signed by the Solovsky Abbot Philip as one betrothed to the throne of the Metropolitan. And after five days, on the 25th of July, 1566, in Dormition Cathedral, in the presence of the Tsar and his family, the whole court and multitude of the people, with the participation of representatives of the entire land of Russia, the consecration of St. Philip as metropolitan, as metropolitan, was solemnly performed. During the celebration of the liturgy, the Tsar entrusted the newly ordained hierarch with the patriarchal pastoral staff of St. Peter the Metropolitan. 
and an assembly of hierarchs led into the hierarchical place where St. Philip delivered his first deeply heartfelt sermon to the Tsar. He spoke to the sovereign about his duty, being the father of his subjects, to meekly hear out those begging for help, to hearken to the misery of the suffering, and to not resolve himself because of the height of his position, knowing that above there is a higher heavenly power. He convinced him to accept the counsel of good men, to turn his ears away from slanderers and flatterers who would seek to blind the mind of the Tsar, not caring for the benefit of the kingdom, <clears throat> but only for the love of power and their own personal gain. In addition, he advised them to be strong in the Orthodox faith and to protect the fatherland from hostile attacks, and guarding the principles of good law from encroachment upon them by evil people. And most of all, remember that the strength and might of a sovereign does not so much consist in military feats as in the love by which he gains the hearts of his subjects. After his speech to the Tsar, the newly consecrated hierarch turned his edifying words to the whole flock. With great joy, those present hearkened to the voice of the archpastor, a voice which already for a long time had not been heard. The Tsar listened without anger to the preaching of the Metropolitan. At the end of the service, he joyfully invited St. Philip, all the clergy and boys, into his own royal chambers. Apparently, the righteous words of the hierarch did not remain without good effects. The Tsar became more gentle in his manner with his subjects. Executions were performed less frequently. Even the Oprichniki grew quieter, seeing the esteem of the Tsar for St. Philip and hearing the censure of the hierarch. This change did not, of course, take place without the people noticing. And once again, hope was born in their souls for a better future. Everyone was encouraged and began to think the end of troubles had already come, and they blessed the good influence of the Metropolitan upon the Tsar. Meanwhile, St. Philip hastened to take advantage of the ensuing peace to devote himself more diligently to the affairs of the Church. His first concern was the appointing of a new bishop in Polos, recently conquered from the Poles. St. Philip clearly understood the importance of this border eparchy, and that is why he was continuously anxious about it, even in the most troubled days of his metropolitanate. Thus, in 1568, after receiving news of the need for, uh, for clergy in Polotsk, he immediately sent there 33 priests and deacons from Novgorod. Detailed information of the other acts of St. Philip has not come down to us, assuming his rule and organizing of church affairs, but if in the post of Abbot of Solovki he showed forth extraordinary deeds, but naturally, no less was he active in the throne of the first hierarch of Moscow. The noisy life of the capital city, to which the saint had already long since become unaccustomed, weighed heavily upon his meek soul. He felt himself orphaned, far from the wonder-workers of Solovki, and often reminiscing about his quiet monastery, he reproachfully said to himself, What has become of you, wretched Philip? Is it possible that the rule over the fathers and the Snobian did not satisfy your vain glory? You wanted more. Behold, from what tranquility you have given yourself over into such labors, and what unperturbed quiet, and to what troubles you have thrust the ship of your soul. Meanwhile, the monastery of Slovakia, owing to his efforts as abbot, blossomed more and more. Nevertheless, even now, in spite of his good order, he did not cease being concerned for it. And even in 1568, the Metropolitan sent instructions concerning the completion of the work begun by him on the broadening of Holy Lake. But the most important thing which concerns St. Philip was already completed there. The Catholicon, which was truly almost built by him when he was on Slovakia, now is completely finished and consecrated in the first year of his ordination at Metropolitan on the very feast day of the Transfiguration of the Lord. The higher among spirit arrived in Moscow with the news of this and brought holy water from the monastery and some relics of the wonder workers for the sovereign and the metropolitan. Similar rare dealings with Slovakia could not satisfy St. Philip. Continuously abiding in its spirit, a hierarch wished to have near himself a material reminder of his spiritual link with the righteous fathers of Solovki. With this intent, he built for himself a small church in Moscow, dedicated to the right of Zosimus and Sabatis, and had it splendidly adorned. There he often resorted for divine service and for solitary prayer in moments of spiritual grief. 
begging the aid of God's grace for his new spiritual service as metropolitan. And this invisible aid was especially necessary for St. Philip, now at the time of great struggle drew nearer. The peace and quiet which came upon Russia with the ordination of St. Philip did not last long. In July of 1567, letters of the Polish king Sigismund and the Lithuanian Hetman Katkevich, with an invitation to depart to Lithuania, were intercepted. Fearful executions began. Not only boyars accused of treason perished in terrible torments, but even many ordinary citizens suffered. Enjoying the unlimited confidence of the Tsar, on Oprichniki, under the appearance of eradicating sedition, raged in Moscow, they slew anyone that was hateful to them and seized their property as they pleased. Blood ran like a river. In the deserted squares and streets of the capital, they scattered the untidy corpses which no one dared to bury. The entire city of Moscow came to a standstill from fear, and the frightened citizens were afraid to come out of their houses. St. Philip, seeing the unceasing outrage of the Oprishniki, decided finally to appeal to the Tsar with exhortations to stop the bloodshed. But before this, he tried to enlist the pastors of the church for this great deed, who were silently resigning themselves to the orders of the Tsar. For what have you gathered, O fathers and brethren, to be silent, afraid to speak the truth? But your silence leads the soul of the Tsar to sin. It appears for a soul of bitter destruction and brings grief and confusion upon the Orthodox. Do you not fear, to, do you fear to forfeit perishable glories? But no power of this world shall save us from eternal torment if we transgress the commandments of Christ and neglect our duty to care for the piety of the right believing Tsar and for the peace and prosperity of all Orthodox Christians. Do you suppose by this to silence the Tsar's counsel? The boy is often strained by worldly cares. But as for us, the Lord has freed us from such things. We have been established to rightly divide the greatest truth, even if we lay down our souls for the flock entrusted to us. You yourselves know that we should be tried for the sake of the truth in the day of judgment. However, the warm appeal of the arch pastor did not find a response or support among his fellow pastors. They had not sufficient courage to go against the Tsar. Therefore, to all the persuasion of Philip, they answered evasively, they were good to obey the Tsar in everything and do his will and not anger him. Nevertheless, some of them, at least in the depths of their souls, agreed with St. Philip. St. Herman, the Archbishop of Kazan, did not conceal his agreement with the Metropolitan, but others, on the contrary, strove with all their strength to bring harm upon him. The selflessness of the saint was unbearable to their ambition. Of these latter were Piemann, Archbishop of Novgorod, who himself had dreamed of becoming metropolitan, Pavnutius of Suzel, and Philopius of Riazan. But more than all did the proto-priest of the Annunciation Church, Eusophius, who was the father confessor of the sovereign, stand against the metropolitan. He enjoyed the greatest favor and confidence of the Tsar, Notwithstanding this, he was hindered from becoming metropolitan. He secretly and openly, at every opportunity, denounced the metropolitan of the Tsar by means of all the slanders and calumnies which his enemies were employing in order to rouse up in the soul of the Tsar to spark a suspicion which had been ignited by the first command of St. Philip about the abolition of the Oprichnik. In spite of the faint heartness of the clergy, the saint was not afraid to address the sovereign alone with admonition, hoping by means of the words of scripture to calm the Tsar's wrath and quiet his resentful soul. At first, these admonitions were in secret. When he saw that they had no effect on him, the saint changed to open accusation. On the 21st of March, 1568, during the week of the cross, Saint Philip addressed Ivan the Terrible with these words in the cathedral church, O sovereign Tsar, you are invested with the highest rank by God. Therefore you ought more than all to honor God. The scepter of earthly power has been given you, in order that you should keep truth among the people and rule them lawfully. By nature you are like unto any other man, but in power you are like unto God himself. 
If it fits you, therefore, as a mortal man, never to exalt yourself, and as the image of God, never to be angry. For only he may justly be called the ruler who possesses himself, and does not act with disgraceful passions, but overcomes them with the help of the mind. When was it heard that pious sovereigns trouble their own country, not only among your ancestors, but even among foreigners, was there never anyone like you? Not accustomed to such a censure, was all said to St. Philip with anger, what are the affairs of our imperial council to you, monk? Do you know that my men want to destroy me? I am a monk of my Christ, answered the saint meekly. And by the grace of the Holy Spirit, by the election of the Holy Synod, and by your good pleasure, I have been set as pastor of the Church of Christ. And the both of us are obliged to have a care for the piety and peace of all Orthodox Christians. One thing I speak, Your Honorable Father, repeated the Tsar, be silent and bless us to do as we please. Pious Tsar, answered Philip, our silence leads you into sin and the destruction of the people, for a bad helmsman undoes all the ship. And if we thus follow the will of men, how shall we say on the day of the coming of Christ, Behold, I and the children which God hath given me? The Lord himself has commanded us to love one another, to lay down one's life for one's friend. These words of love slightly quieted the angry Tsar. He began to justify his cruelty, saying that his secret enemies surrounded him, speaking in the words of the prophet David, saying, Holy Vodika, my friends and my neighbors do nigh over against me and still, and my nearest of kin that are far off, and they that seek after my soul use violence. The saint answered, Sovereign, it is really evil in my people. One must distinguish between good and bad people. Draw to yourself the people who desire to give you good advice and not flatterers, those who are concerned for the common good, not those who are seeking power. It is sinful to not put a stop to those who are seeking power. It is sinful to not put a stop to transgressors. But why tear us under your commonwealth? We have been established by God to judge the people of God in righteousness not to present yourself as a tormentor, convict those who speak unjustly before you, cut them off from yourself as rotten members, and establish your people in unity. For God about his own labor there is common as the sea of us. The Zaha cried out, Do not oppose our power. My anger shall not come upon you, or else abandon your position. Well, St. Philip said to him, I do not ask this throne from you, or send your decessors before you, or did anyone bribe you that I should receive it? Why did you yourself deprive me of the wilderness? If you dare to act against the law, do as you wish. But it is unforgivable for me to weaken when the time of struggle has come. At these words, with a greatly troubled mind and with anger, Zara departed to his palace. The enemies of St. Philip availed themselves of this, the Oprichniki Malyut Skolotov, Basil Griazne together with their confederates, those who had already for a long time been seeking an occasion to avenge themselves on the entire accuser of their outrages. They entreated the Tsar to not to give them over to Philip, because of his words, to not keep the accustomed manner of life of the Oprichniki, and they strove to suggest to Ivan the Terrible that Philip was allied with his boyer enemies whom he was covering. The attempts of the enemies of St. Philip did not remain fruitless. The Tsar did not listen to the admonitions of the Metropolitan, and he continued his former manner of life. Moreover, his cruelty increased more and more. Executions followed upon executions, and the Oprichniki, encouraged by this, brought terror on everyone. In despair, the citizens of Moscow came to the Metropolitan and entreated him for protection. And St. Philip, himself troubled in the depths of his soul, alone maintained good spirits in the people and faith in a better future. Do not grieve, children, said the saint. The Lord is faithful and will not allow us to be tempted beyond our strength. He will not allow us to perish unto the end. And if the enemy of mankind raises a conflict upon it, then it will soon turn upon his own head. Did not the Lord say, It must needs be the defenseless come, but woe unto that man by whom the offense cometh. There are crowns prepared for you, and a blessed struggle faces me. The apostle said, God has no respect for persons. 
And David furnishes me with this song. And I speak of my testimonies before kings, and I was not ashamed. All of this, beloved of God, has befallen us because of our sins, but our salvation and correction. Behold, the axe lies upon the roof. But remember, God has not promised us earthly blessings, but heavenly ones. Therefore I rejoice, and I am able to suffer for you, for you are my answer before God. You are my crown from the Lord. And after these words with their shepherd, the inhabitants departed to their own homes, comforted and set at peace. After a short time, one Sunday, there was a hierarchical service in Dormition Cathedral. During the service, suddenly the Tsar appeared in the church with a multitude of a Prichniki and members of the court. The Tsar and his retinue were all in black tall hats and black robes. The Tsar approached St. Philip, who was standing in the metropolitan place, and waited for his blessing. Three times he turned to the hierarch, but he answered him not a word, as if he did not notice the presence of the Tsar. Finally, the warrior said, Holy Wadika, the pious Tsar, Ivan Vasilievich of all Russia, has come to your holiness and requests your blessing. Then St. Philip, looking at the Tsar and approaching him, spoke thus, Sovereign, who have you emulated, having changed the splendor of your throne and clothed yourself in this unbecoming manner? Since the time the sun shone in the sky, has it not been heard of that a pious Tsar should trouble his own kingdom? Fear the judgment seat of God and be ashamed of your purple, opposing the laws of her others, for which you make yourself deserving of conviction. The righteousness of a sovereign is in judgment, according to the word of Scripture. But you work only in justice upon your people. How the Orthodox suffer. Among all peoples, even among the Tartars and the heathen, are there law and justice. Only among us now there are not. Everywhere we find mercy, but in Russia now there is no pity for either the innocent or the just. Sovereign, we bring a pure and unbloody sacrifice to the Lord for the salvation of the people. But behind the altar is being poured out the innocent blood of Christians. Although you are glorified the manner of God, nevertheless you are a mortal man. The Lord shall exact everything at your hand. You have deeply searched out the divine scriptures, I know. Why do you not follow them? Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither, have, neither he that loveth not his brother. Philip, said the Tsar with anger, you think to change our will? It be better for you to be like-minded with us. Then for what is our faith, answered the saint, the sufferings of the Savior, and the commandments which were given us are in vain. If we now scatter that which the Lord granted us, in order that we should observe them purely. I do not grieve for those who have innocently been given over to death like martyrs. I grieve for you, caring for your salvation. But Ivan the terrible already was not listening to the words of the righteous Philip, and waved his hand against the hierarch and threatened him with various torrents and banishments. Do you dare to oppose our pal, he cried? We shall see your steadfastness. I am a stranger and a sojourner upon the earth, quietly answered the saint of this. I shall act as all my fathers had for the truth of piety, even if being deprived of my sea and the enduring of fierce sufferings before me, I shall not submit to you. Beside himself with rage, Zar left the church, having decided to destroy his accuser. But he still did not dare to lay a hand on the most respected of hierarchs. It was necessary first to injure him in the eyes of the people. He had opened the wide field for every kind of slander. Thus wishing to humiliate the Metropolitan publicly, while still in the church, the enemies of St. Philip prepared the most malicious slanders against the elder, which they instructed the young reader of the Metropolitan's home church to proclaim before the people. After hearing these things, Piemann of Novgorod and some other bishops, pleased of the Tsar, as if believing the words, exclaimed with indignation, he accuses the Tsar and himself works iniquity. Once St. Philip heard this, he answered Piman, Although you please man and seek to possess another's throne, you shall soon be deprived of your own. The bishops who were sympathetic with St. Philip, of course, understood all of the absurdity of the charges which were imputed to him, but they did not dare to utter a single word in his defense. So they entreated the saint to forgive the unwilling calumniator, who there and then confessed with tears in his eyes before his uncle, the church steward Haralambus, that he had spoken also by compulsion and by fear. Seeing the repentance of the young man, the good shepherd said tenderly to him, 
The merciful Christ be with you and grant you forgiveness, but you should sever yourself from those who have taught you this iniquity. Then the saints turned to the bishop and said, I see that death is being prepared for me, but do you know why they wish to banish me and are rousing up the czar against me? Because I did not flatter them or give them wealthy garments or entertain them with banquets. However, as it ever was, I shall not cease to speak the truth, nor shall I bear the hierarchical responsibility in vain. <laughs> After this clash with the Tsar, St. Philip moved from the Kremlin to the monastery of St. Nicholas the Old. During these scenes, the horrors of the Aprichniki continued both in the capital and far beyond its borders, as if for the harm of the Metropolitan, the Tsar permitted himself every kind of abomination. He put the Prince Basil Kronsky to death, who had just taken up monasticism, and raged in the environment of Moscow. He burned boyer villages and abducted their wives and destroyed their cattle. Seeing in St. Philip their defender, the people did not leave him. And the Tsar, his meetings with him, could not speak with the Metropolitan without anger. The 28th of July came, the day of the Holy Apostles, Procor, and the Canon. On this day, the occasion of the Cathedral Peace Day, the translation of the icon of the Mother of God Directress of Smolensk, the Metropolitan performed the usual procession around the walls of the Novo de Vici Monastery. The Tsar himself arrived according to his custom, surrounded by a band of Oprichniki. When the procession reached the Holy Gates and stopped for the reading of the Holy Gospel, St. Philip turned towards the people to say, Peace to all. Suddenly, he noticed the Oprichnik standing behind the Tsar in his Tatar headgear. The prayers of our Holy Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, of mercy and Son. Indignation troubled the soul of the saint. And turning to the Tsar, he said, When the divine doxology is being celebrated and the word of God is being read, it is proper to listen with uncovered head. And what do these people follow this haggarine custom to stand with covered head? Are not all here of one religion? What? Who is this? answered the Tsar. Some of your bodyguard will come with you, answered the saint. The Tsar glanced around at his retinue, but the Aprichnik in question already taken off and hidden his headgear. This angered the Tsar, and he wished to find out without fail who committed his lawlessness. Nevertheless, none of those present dared reveal the guilty one because he was one of the Tsar's favorites. Those nearby Ivan the Terrible even managed to convince him that the Metropolitan was lying, mocking publicly at his royal power. Then, in rage, the Tsar began to abuse the saint harshly, calling him a liar and a rebel, and swore that he would expose him in everything. From this day, he began to bring to fulfillment his intention concerning the dethronement of Saint Philip. Desiring to give to his plan the appearance of lawfulness, Ivan the Terrible did not intend to arrange a public trial of the righteous one. He wished the Metropolitan to be dethroned as if by his own foolish behavior. With this aim, the Tsar ordered all of his headboarders and all the headboarders and officials of the Metropolitan to be seized. He imprisoned them on the guard, tortured them, hoping to find out something evil about the saint, but he learned nothing. Then, not hoping to discover a reason for the accusation of St. Philip in Moscow, where his life shining with virtues is well known to all, he went to Solovki. He sent to Solovki. Some who were notorious for their enmity with the saint, Pavnutius, the Bishop of Suzel, the Archmandrite Theodosius of Andronievsky, and the Prince Basil Temkina, the military escort, as if for an investigation of his local life. Having arrived at the monastery of Solovki, they made use of every means, kindnesses and threats, gifts and promises of honor, in order to find among the monks false witnesses against the Metropolitan. More than all strove the hierarch Paphnutius, who did not wish to hear one word of truth about St. Philip. With the promise of the episcopacy, he went over to his side the abbot Aisi, the unworthy successor of St. Philip as abbot, a few of the like-minded monks were enticed by the example of their habit, and they worked on the others with threats. They were, however, pious elders and Solovki, who, in spite of the threats and even tortures, did not consent to lie. They unanimously testified to the spotless life of St. Philip, his father to care for the salvation of the brethren entrusted to his supervision. But the followers of the Tsar did not listen to them. 
having recorded slanders and false evidence against the saint, and having taken with them Piety and other slanders, they hastened to Moscow. The Tsar Ivan the Terrible, to whom the false accusations against St. Philip were immediately delivered, was satisfied with them and ordered the boys and bishops to meet in the Dormition Cathedral for an open court trial of the Metropolitan. This was on November 4th. At the appointed time, the Tsar himself arrived with the unjustly accused first hierarch, confessed that in his episcopal habit he appeared in the court. The reading of the denunciations began, but his accusers were not present. The Tsar was afraid to give the saint a confrontation with the slanderers. After the reading of the denunciations, they stopped in order to hear the accused. The saint, considering it unnecessary to justify himself, for he knew that his fate was already decided upon, turned to the Tsar, saying, Sovereign and great prince, do you think that I fear either you or death? No, it is better to die an innocent martyr than on the throne of the Metropolitan to silently bear with the horrors of lawlessness. Do what pleases you. Here is the patriarchal staff, the hierarchical cloak and mantle with which you wish to resolve me. And you servants of the altar, continue the saint, turning to the bishops, faithfully shepherd the flock of Christ. Be prepared to give ass to God and fear the sovereign of heaven more than the sovereign of earth. Having spoken these words, St. Philip took off the signs of his dignity and wished to depart. But the Tsar stopped him, saying that he ought yet to await the council's decision and not be his own judge. He compelled him to take back his episcopal insignia and to again serve the liturgy on the 8th of November. It was the feast of the Archangel Michael. The Metropolitan stood at his place in the Dormition Cathedral in full vestments, preparing for the last time to serve the unbloody sacrifice of the Lord. Suddenly the doors of the church were thrown open with a great noise, and the Tsar's favorite uh, Alexis Basmanov entered with a company of soldiers and a Prichniki. Divine services broken off. Basmanov ordered all the people to read aloud the Tsar's decree and the sentence of the council about the dethronement of the Metropolitan, during which it proclaimed all the slanders against him. Upon the completion of the reading, those who had arrived threw themselves upon the saint in rage and began to tear off from him his hierarchical vestments. St. Philip was not the servant soul. He tried to calm his clergy. Children, he said, it is sorrowful for my soul to be separated from you, but I rejoice that I am enduring all this for the church of God. The time has come for her widowhood. For her shepherds, like hirelings, shall be despised. They shall not maintain their throne here. You should not be buried in this holy church of the Mother of God. Having thrown over the shoulders of the saint a ragged and dirty rasa of a common monk, the Aprishniki threw him out of the church, beating him with brooms upon the head. They sat him on a sled, and heaping insults and blows upon him, led him to the Epiphany Monastery. The crowd of people, having completely blocked the narrow Nikolai Street, accompanied the arch past of its years. He courageously endured his humiliation, and with a joyous countenance, blessed the spiritual flock on both sides, is ordering them to have patience and pray to God. Before the gates of the monastery, St. Philip turned for the last time to the surrounding flock with consoling words, I accept all this for the sake of your welfare, that your confusion might be calm. Were it not for love for you, I would not wish to remain here one more day. The word of God restrains me, the good shepherd lay it down his own life for the sheep. Be not afraid, all this is from the evil one, for the Lord permitted this is our health, or Christ is with us, of whom should we be afraid? I am ready to suffer for you, and your love shall weave me a crown in the future age. The victory is attained through sufferings. But I beseech you, do not give up hope, for with love the Lord chastens us for our redemption, not by means of another's sufferings, but by means of one's own and or grief from them with joy, for the Lord ordered us to do good for those who hate us and to pray for them. The God of all orders all things for our profit according to his goodness. When they had taken their last blessing from the Metropolitan, the people departed to their homes in confusion, and the saint was imprisoned in the monastery. And after a few days, the throne Metropolitan was taken with the same dishonor to the bishop's residence, 
to announce to him the final verdict. Here in the presence of the Tsar and the bishops, the abbot of Solovki, Paisi, with great impudence, confirmed all those accusations against St. Philip, which he had earlier presented in writing to the Tsar with his confederates. The saint said to Paisi, his own disciple, The grace of God be on your lips, my child. The flattering lips have been opened against me. Have you never heard the word of God? Who shall say to his brother, thou fool, shall be in danger of the fire of Gehenna? And remember that other saying of Holy Scripture, what a man so actually read, and this is not my word, this is the word of the Lord. A great tumult arose. The saints stood like a sheep in the midst of wolves. They pronounced them guilty of various crimes and even of sorcery. There is information that Ivan the Terrible, not satisfied with the dethronement of the Metropolitan, wished even to have him condemned to burning. And only by the intercession of the clergy did he agree to leave him his life, having determined upon life imprisonment in the monastery instead of execution. But his own fate did not frighten the saint. At the present time, as always, in his heart, he was anxious for unhappy Russia. And again, for the last time, he turned to the Tsar with admonitions, entreating him to take pity on his subjects and to cease his impious deeds. Remember the ancient sovereigns and princes, and behold the present ones. Those that good are blessed even now. Those that truly rule are accursed. And you, beloved of Christ, imitate the ways of the good. Not answering one word to Saint Philip, the Tsar ordered the guards to put the Holy Elder in the dungeon. The Tsar knew that his own servants would not spare from the throne hierarchy. Verily, they made use of every means to the sooner bring about the death of their only steadfast refuser. Having locked the aged sufferer in a stifling and squalid prison, they bound his hands with iron fetters, forced his neck into the, uh, forced his feet into the stunks, threw a heavy iron chain upon his neck. Finally, thinking to starve him to death for a whole week, they gave him nothing to eat. But the prisoner from his youth was accustomed to fasting and abstinence, body strength and prayer on all sides. Behold, the iron fetters fell from the hands and neck of the righteous one by themselves, and his feet were freed from the stocks. Some boyers who were sent by the Tsar to learn whether St. Philip was yet alive reported to him what had happened. But the miracle did not bring the Tsar to his senses, and he exclaimed, Sorcery! My traitor works sorcery! Also, there is information that the Tsar ordered a hungry bear to be led into the prisoner, when on another day he himself went into the dungeon, but to his astonishment he saw St. Philip standing on hearth in prayer, and that the bear lay calmly in the corner. After this the Holy Supper was transferred to the monastery of Nicholas the Old, which was the appointed place of the imprisonment of the dethroned Retropolitan, where his upkeeping had been fixed at a meager three kopecks a day. Wishing as soon as possible to efface the memory of St. Philip from the mind of the people, Ivan the Terrible hastened to assign a new metropolitan, the choice that all the weak but good elder, the Archmanch right of the Trinity, Lavra Cyril. On the 11th of November, he was already raised to the metropolitan's throne. It seemed that, with the suffering of St. Philip, the spite of the vengeful Tsar was bound to abate. But the wrathful Ivan was not satisfied and prepared for the innocent sufferer yet graver trials. Knowing by what means to grieve the saint more than he could endure, he began a savage reprisal against the people who were close to the Blessed One. One after another, they slew ten of the Metropolitan's kinsmen in torments and tortures, and one of them, one of, uh, a beloved nephew of St. Philip, they beheaded after cruel tortures. The Tsar ordered them to sew the head up in a bag and bring it to the imprisoned saint with a message, Here's the head of your kinsman. Your sorcery did not help him. St. Philip took the cruel gift of reverence and placed the bloody head before him, bowing to the earth and kissed it with tears and said, Blessed is you now as chosen and taken to thyself, O Lord. The patience and manliness with which St. Philip endured his sufferings did not bring the Tsar to his senses. What vexed him even more was that the sympathy of the people was clearly on the side of the great hierarchy. And Cesar decided to send him away from Moscow to be imprisoned at the Tversky Ruch Monastery. St. Philip underwent many hardships during the journey. 
and its consequent incarceration. His poor clothes hardly protected him from the freezing weather. Often they did not bring him food for several days. Worse than that, the cruel offers of Stephen Cobelin and the other guards treated him roughly and at times in humor. But St. Philip endured all with meekness, and not once did a single reproach fall from his lips against his tormentors, nor did he utter a single complaint about his suffering. St. Philip languished in prison for the passage of one year. In December of 1569, Ivan the Terrible moved against Novgorod with an army in order to punish it for alleged treason. He went as if to war, destroying everything in his path. When he drew nigh to Tver, he remembered the Metropolitan Philip, who was in prison there, and sent him the worst of his originity, Malyard Skorotov, as if for his blessing. St. Philip, foreknowing his end three days in advance, said to those about him, the time of the completion of my struggle is at hand, my departure is near. Having partaken of the holy mysteries, he calmly awaited his end. Malliot entered into the cell, and humbling bowing, said to the saint, Holy Vodika, give your blessing to the Tsar to go to Great Novgorod. Knowing why this messenger of the Tsar had come, Saint Philip answered him, Do that for which you came to me, and do not tempt me with flatteries as if seeking the gift of God. Having said this, the saint raised up his last prayer to God, Master, Lord Almighty, receive my soul in peace, and send to me from thine all holy glory an angel of peace to guide me to thy three son Godhead. May I not be forbidden to rise above the prince of darkness, and do not put me to shame before thine angels, but count me among the chosen. For blessed art thou to the ages. Amen. Malliot then took a pillow and suffocated St. Philip. He hastily left the cell and announced to the superior and brethren about his death and began to upbraid them for their negligence of the prisoner as though he had died from excessive fumes in the cell. In horror, the monks gathered when they learned of the death of the right of Zelda, and from fear were unable to say a single word. Not giving them time to come to their senses, Malian ordered them to dig a deep hole behind the altar of the Catholicon and in his presence to bury the long-suffering body of the saint of Christ right away. During this, there was neither the ring of bells, nor the sweet fragrance of incense, nor probably even the chants of the church, because the evil of Prishnik hastened to conceal the traces of his crime. When the grave was even with the earth, he immediately departed from the monastery. Thus did the great saint of Christ that avenged his life, and struggled for truth, and suffered for the peace and prosperity of his fatherland. The date of his martyr's death was December 23rd, 1569. The enemies of St. Philip did not exult for long. Soon the wrath of God overtook his persecutors. The heart of his executioner, Malius Skorosov, was severely wounded and slain not long after his evil deed. The Tsar apparently was heavily burdened by this crime and placed a terrible shame upon all the perpetrators and accomplices of the execution. The unfortunate Archbishop of Novgorod Piman, when he was dethroned, was imprisoned in the Venevsky Nikolaev Monastery, <clears throat> lived there in constant fear of death, and Philotheus of Riazan was the pride of his bishopric. The cruel officer who guarded the saint, Stephen Kobelin, was not forgotten. He was tonsured a monk against his will, and imprisoned in the Spasi Kameni Monastery on Lake Kubenska. The wrath of the Tsar mainly overtook the monastery of Slavovki. The ambitious abbot Paisi, instead of the episcopacy promised him, was sent to Valang. The monk Zosimus and the nine other monks would slander the Metropolitan, likewise scattered different monasteries. Many of them perished all the way to the places of their banishment and grievous illnesses. As if for the punishment of all the brethren, the enraged Tsar sent to Solovki another monk, Barlam, a higher monk of the Belozers Kirilova monastery for its direction in the rank of abbot, but only at the end of his days did Ivan the Terrible turn again his goodwill upon the monastery of Slavovki, bestowing upon a great monetary deposits and gifts for the remembrance of those who were disgraced and suffered from his wrath against the Solovetsky and Novgorodsky monks. The mercy of the Tsar returned, <clears throat> but one loss was irreparable, the deprivation of the relics of her unfortunate superior Saint Philip. Already twenty years had passed since the day of his repose, and the Tsar's throne was now no longer occupied by Ivan the Terrible, 
but by his meek and pious son, Theodore Ivanovich, and the honored body of St. Philip, repose in Tyre at the Tversky of Roch Monastery, the pious monks solemnly grieve deeply over this, remembering the indefatigable labors and care of St. Philip for their monastery. Finally, they decided to entreat their abbot James to intercede with the Tsar for permission to translate the relics of St. Philip to his own monastery of Solovki. Father James himself had for a long time thought about this, and therefore he received the request of the brethren of love, seeing in it the inspiration of God. Carrying not at all, he set out on his journey, appearing before the Tsar. He said to him in behalf of all the brethren of Solovki, Grant us, O pious Tsar, our fellow deserts of Philip was banished from his throne by the slanders of his own disciples and buried in a foreign place. From his youth he bore labors with the fathers of our monastery. Now there hangs upon us an oath which we had made to him. The Tsar's permission must then grant us again the blessing of which we have been deprived. The Tsar Theodore <coughs> fulfilled the request of the Solovki monks and sent a letter to Zacharias, the Bishop of Tver, about the translation of the relics of St. Philip to Solovki. Zacharias was unable to disobey the Tsar's command and ordered the abbot of Wolfroch Monastery <coughs> to show the place where St. Philip had been buried. When they had dug up the grave and uncovered the tomb, the air was filled with a fragrance which poured forth from the radics as it were from an exceeding precious myrrh. The body of the same was found completely incorrupt, and even his clothing was preserved intact. Citizens began to throng from everywhere in order to venerate the passion bearer of Christ. The bishop was moved to tears and fell before the grave of the saint, entreating him to remember in his prayers to God himself and the city in which he had completed his modest struggle, and where for many years his venerable relics had reposed. Having delivered the reliquary of the holy remains <coughs> to the abbot James, the bishop, together with all the clergy, with crosses and banners, <coughs> brought the holy things to the banks of the river Volga in the presence of a great gathering of the people whence they bore them off with joy to their distant monastery. Upon the arrival of the Holy Relics at the docks of Solovki, all the brethren, accompanied by a multitude of people, came out to meet them with candles and lanterns. With the chanting of holy hymns, they transferred the reliquary of the saints' remains to the devotion of the Transfiguration, which he himself had built by his own labors, and placed them in the midst of the church. On the following day, after the celebration of solemn divine service, the incorrupt body of St. Philip was entombed in the place preserved, reserved for him under the porch of the Transfiguration Church beside the chapel of St. Zosimus and Sabathius. There to this day is preserved on a white stone tablet the inscription in the year 7078, Metropolitan Philip proposed in Sfer on the 23rd of December, in 1799, the relics of St. Philip were brought to Solovetsk Monastery and entombed on the 8th of August. But now, this modest inscription indicates the empty grave in which the relics of the saint did repose in 55 years. The Lord was wondrous in his saints, glorified the great and God-pleasing Philip with the power of working miracles. His venerable relics became a source of healing for all with faith called upon its holy name. Let us mention a few of the miracles of St. Philip. Soon after the translation of the relics of the St. Solovki, the monastery worker of Basil was sent together with some others to view wood for the renovation of the church. During the work, great trees fell on Basil and crushed him so much it was only with great difficulty that they carried the broken body of the worker back to the monastery. Tormented by grievous affliction, for three years he lay enfeebled, and it seemed that he must give up all hope of recovery. Only faith and help from on high did not abandon him. Who by this faith, he began to fervently entreat St. Philip, Thou art my hope and refuge, O passion bearer. Save me, who am now perishing. The feast of the Nativity of Christ had come. The friends of Basil rolled apart from madness, but he remained alone, lamenting a grief that he was not able to go to the Church of God. In tears and pains, Basil weakened and fell into a light sleep. And behold, it seemed to him that he was in matins together with his brethren, and before him was St. Philip in hierarchical vestments, with candles in his hands, shining in radiant light. The wondrous man drew nigh the ailing man, and said, Stand up, Basil, and be well in the name of the Lord, and go. And with these words he took his hand, and raised Basil from the bed. 
Sick from fear, he awoke in amazement and saw himself standing next to his bed, in which he had not been able to move for three years. Having collected himself, immediately set out for church, where the Matins doxology was taking place. But having declared to the brethren the miracle, he prostrated himself before the tomb of the saint with tears of thanksgiving. In this manner was the higher monk Gerontius miraculously healed. The monk Gregory, who lived together with him in the same cell, related that Father Gerontius' teeth became diseased. They desired to pull them out. Then another illness joined the first. His legs became so weak that he was unable to get up from his place. In such an agonizing condition did Gregory find Gerontius. Once he asked Gregory, his cellmate, to bring him to the shrine of St. Philip. Gregory fulfilled this request. The ailing monk had hardly touched the grave of the saint when the pain in his teeth lessened and his legs were as if they had not been sick. Gerontius received complete healing. Not only monks hastened to St. Philip with prayers, but also laymen, the neighboring inhabitants, and they received healing of their ailments. In one of the seaside villages near the river Varguza, there lived a silversmith called John. Once he came to the monastery of Slavovsky, related that for a long time he had suffered from inner pains, and since no doctor's treatment helped him, he had a spirit of healing. One night, when John had dozed off a little in weakness, a radiant man appeared to him in vicious vestments and asked him, What ails you? He answered that his stomach pains him and showed him the place. The one who had appeared signed him with the sign of the cross and said, Do you not know me? I am Philip, the Metropolitan, from Solovsky. With these words, he became invisible. John came to himself and felt himself completely well and offered prayers and gratitude to the great wonder work. The glory of the miracles of St. Philip in a short time spread everywhere. The whole northern coastal region flowed into the monastery of Solovsky the venerated tomb of St. Philip, and his memory as a new defender of the Russian land was glorified long before the opening of the Holy Relics. Local feast days in honor of the saint began to be observed at the time of the translation of his relics to Slovovsky. In December of 1636, a service in the saint's honor was already chanted. The solemn opening of his relics followed only ten years after this time. In 1646, on the 29th of April, two letters were sent from the Tsar Alexis Mikhailovich and the Most Holy Joseph, Patriarch of Moscow, to Elias, the abbot of Solovsky. In these letters, it was commanded the relics of St. Philip the Metropolitan be opened and placed in a new tomb, and if his garment be found to be tattered or decayed, to vest him in a new one, and transfer him from under the porch to the Transfiguration Church, and to celebrate the day of his translation every year. With feelings of lively joy, the monks met this command, and having appointed the day of the opening as the 31st of May, they began to prepare for the solemnity, they fasted and prayed zealously, and entreated mercy from God as knew the revealed St. Philip. Finally, the day of the Radiant Festival came, after Matins, the abbot Elias, together with all the brethren, bearing a multitude of candles, with crosses and a new reliquary for the wonder worker, set out for the place where St. Philip was at rest. Here at the time of the singing of the Malabans, some higher monks transferred the relics of the saint to the new reliquary. However, they had left on him the old vestments, for they had not decayed at all, although they had lain in the earth for about eighty years. Then, accompanied by a procession of greatly inspired people, the venerable relics of St. Philip were transferred to the Church of the Transfiguration of the Lord with inspired chanting, a place there with his right side against the iconostas, the glory of God, the all worshipful Trinity. Amen.